Keith, pleasure to finally secure time. We've been trying to get this in the bag for months, I think, months now. And then COVID's just been sticking two fingers up and saying, no, it's not happening. And then, uh, and in fact, I think in my classical me stubbornness, no, we're not doing a Zoom call. And now I've got no choice. Everyone's, yeah. on a, everyone's online now. So even in this format, mate, it's, it, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Pleasure to have you. Uh, thank you very much for having me, mate. Let's, uh, let's get straight into it, right? Um, you are, obviously, we've got, we've got similar backgrounds. You, you British Army, you serve a two-para, I serve a three-para. So our, 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 our careers sort of crossed over in terms of time when we were both serving. Um, but moving on from that, um, I have an interest in psychedelics, as are you. My interest is very, I mean, I'm on the start of my journey, if you like, right? Mm. But you at the moment are, at the moment, and have been for a while, you're involved in, you want to make psychedelics psychedelic substances more uh, legally accessible by by people who could benefit from them mentally would that be a right would that be a correct outline of the uh, correct summary yeah uh, i would go further than just mental i believe there are other uh, opportunities in psychedelics but there's a great place to start there's so many people are struggling with their mental health uh, and psychedelics <laughs> as I've, I've said many times in this journey that I'm on, but the, the anecdotal evidence for the benefits of psychedelic therapy is now entirely overwhelming. Uh, what we need is for the scientific community to catch up, and I'm sure we'll talk about that in, in, in the coming hour or so. Uh, the data needs to catch up, but it is, it is catching up. That All of the evidence is strongly suggestive of incredible benefits in multiple different regions of someone's uh, healing requirements, therapeutic requirements. So it's, it's, it's a very, very exciting field and it's a really exciting time in that field because it feels like it's going to explode and it's to the benefit of the majority of our society, not just the veterans community. Why do you feel so strongly about it? What's your own, what's your own background experience with this? I mean, mental health and the and the psychedelics impact on that yeah so i feel so strongly because it's my own personal experience as well uh, so i 2008 i was with two power in afghanistan and that was a difficult summer much like those summers many of those summers were during that period and i came back started struggling like you know i had a very typical experience i think the majority of us struggled with those experiences um, and I found that again, a very typical experience is that when I asked for help through the military, when I was still in the military, really the response was twofold. It was, you can either have pharmaceuticals like antidepressants, like sertraline, for instance, that was what I was prescribed and, or you can have talking therapies like CBT, both of which I tried a few times as well. Um, both of them, particularly pharmaceuticals, the sertraline, the antidepressants, they were unhelpful is the politest term I've got for it. Um, and so I felt like I didn't, that was the only two options that I had. So I felt a little bit hopeless when they weren't working for me. And I started to kind of spiral out of control. I left the military, walked into an incredible job in the city working for JP, JP Morgan and but i was unraveling fast and none of the let's say conventional treatments no, none of them were working no, nothing did none of them did anything for me and some of them were detrimental and so i was pretty much losing hope and that's when i was introduced to the idea of um, psychedelic therapy in the form of ayahuasca and ayahuasca is a medicinal um, tea that's um, uh, it's like made in the Amazon basin. I went to the Peruvian Amazon basin uh, for my experience and I went there hopeless. I left there psychologically healed of my past traumas. That's not only my Afghanistan experiences, but of relationship breakdowns, all sorts of personal traumas and sufferings that I had experienced in my life up until that point. Psychologically, they, they had been healed. I'd been healed. I walked out of that jungle and I came home and I thought, why, 
why are we not able to do this? Why, why is this illegal when it can have this benefit? Can I ask what the choice, sorry to interrupt. Can I ask what the, so I take it when you went to the, uh, with the Peruvian Amazon Basin that you are, you are what, on, a, on a leave from JP Morgan? Yeah, I just went on my holiday. Went on um, holiday. Why did you choose that area then? Uh, my, so I had a network. So a friend of mine, she's an American. She had an experience in a nearby area in Peru and she'd made, she'd made friends with people in the jungle and they had a little wooden hut that was in an air, a very remote area of the jungle. But they said that they would let me use their little hut for free. And the nearby village, the shaman, the, the local healer, he came and spent time with me in that little hut, spent 10 days, I think it was. And um, so it wasn't, I didn't do any research. It wasn't with a tourist uh, kind of, or, it wasn't with an organization or, anything that was, uh, there was no structure to it at all. It was just this local man came and helped me. So I wouldn't say that this is a typical experience, not in the least, <laughs> um, but for me, it's what I needed at that point. Uh, but there are lots of um, organizations and facilities in that region. The majority of them very responsible, very professional and very safe. Um, but my experience was actually quite atypical is that I went alone and had a very solitary experience. But like I say, for me personally, that's what I needed to do at the time. Yeah. Well, what was your mindset going there then? So, so, so symptoms wise, what were you, what were you experiencing before you went? Oh, symptoms. So um, I was very tense physically. I was, I was holding myself in a stress position all day and all night. So my sleeping pattern was not, I, I didn't sleep. I, yeah, physically tense, like in my arms, in my shoulders, in my chest, in my abdomen, leap low down in my abdomen felt like I had a piece of lead in there. Um, that caused me to sweat excessively because my body was being tense the whole time. So I was just pouring with sweat all the time. It was exhausting, really exhausting. And my mind was just running at a thousand miles an hour all the time, all the time. It, totally exhausting, which I don't think this is a atypical experience of, of a lot of veterans. I think this sort of tension and this very fast running frantic mind, I think that's fairly common from what I now working in this environment feels very typical of the experiences that we share. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I had that for a long time. Uh, uh, yeah, I did. I had it for a long time during what I now know is to be a point in, which was really, really, really low in my mental health. And I mean, and over that, over that sort of prolonged period of really bad mental health, there is this, there are a couple of specific points where it's like super low, like the worst, mm. but looking back, the whole thing was, I was in, I was in tatters. And, and that was one of this, one of those symptoms there was, was a, a race in mind, which you, which for me, you, I just thought that was me. You know, that's how, just how I, that's how I function man like you say is exhausting and the ability to focus the ability to concentrate and it takes a long time to get out of it but yeah i, I understand it i mean the, the uh and that stress position analogy i mean you, things like that are like the smaller versions like grinding your teeth you know all, yeah. all kinds of little things is all odd up yeah no I, I i some of that i can i can empathize with and i'm sure people listening or watching can empathize with other things you're saying um and again not 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 military specific you know, no. this is, crosses over to other other walks of life. Other, Absolutely. Uh, other, yeah, I, I often say that, um, you know, the symptoms we experience are common across all people who, who, who experience uh, mental health struggles. You know, it's, but the, it's the journey by which we get to have those symptoms, which is different, you know. Yep. But sorry, I, yep. I, I interrupted. But go on, I just, I, the reason I asked about the symptoms before you went there is I was trying to understand what, what state you were in because... You didn't go there. I, I can't be wrong. You didn't go to the Peruvian base and look in to get a, a fix, if you like, to get fixed, did you? Well, I, I was so hopeless, mate. Yeah, I kind of was, actually. It was okay. the last chance saloon, you know, just was, nothing else was working. Um, I say that. That's not technically true because part of what I do professionally now, I teach um, what's called the internal arts, also internal martial arts, things like Tai Chi and Qigong, meditation. Um, so 
concurrently, I'd just been introduced to those practices just before I was going to Peru. So I, I studied in China a couple of times and they, they have been life-saving as well, but they're as a combined form of treatment, they're very, very good. So psychedelic therapy and these other practices, these daily practices that I do, as opposed to this one-off massive event, this catalyst for healing, then the other practices, it's what I do every day, you know, for an hour or two. Meditation and discipline and routine. They're just those things alone, you know, and they're forms of meditation. That is where they say, exactly. I see the physical fitness as a form of meditation in a way and a form of routine. It keeps me on the street. It's the, it's the point of reference by which I can hang everything else. You know, that bit of, but a bit of routine that it's the normality. If everything else is crazy, I've got something I can, I've got a point of reference I can cling on to when everything's falling around yeah. around me. But um, it's really I, important that that discipline, that, you know, our community as well is, is pretty good for it. Have, but that personal discipline to do something, take responsibility for yourself and do something every day. Yes, physical exercise is important. It's not enough on its own, but it's very, very important. But trying to find a time when you can be physically still and mentally still and just spend some time in that state every day, even if it's five minutes, two, two minutes. Yeah. You've got to start somewhere. Yeah. Let, let, let's... Um... Yeah, let's come back to the. I, I really want to focus on. Sorry, I, it was me. I took it off. There. I really want to focus on the psychedelic aspect. Yeah, for, for, for my own understand more than anything. Like I said, I'm at the start of a journey. I think um, I've experienced some benefits from psychedelics quite recently, on a really small scale. And but like anything, I, I there is skepticism around it. Okay, um, I've heard a lot of anecdotal stuff and read a lot and seen a lot of the benefits it can have. All right, but uh, I want to understand it more. So I, I take the if I'm going to take further steps, take the right steps forward and do it properly, because you do it wrong, it just it, it's you know it, it just not just not great. So I'm really keen to hear your experience. Tell me about You're this. Absolutely Tell right you... there as well, by the way. Go on, go on. And now I'm just a big believer in you do these things right. You don't. There's the opportunity for healing anyway, regardless. Okay, but there's also the opportunity for things to go a little bit awry. You can have you can have a difficult experience, all right? So it's important that if you're unsure, like you've just admitted to yourself, if you're uncertain, then you need to do a little bit of research and ask people that trustworthy reference points about how to do this properly in a safe way. So that's, we can talk about that a little bit later, yeah. but that's very important. The other aspect to it is you got the healing aspect, if that's what you're after. You know, you got the you can go pair ship aspect, like if you're mixing stuff up, or, or if you're in the right wrong frame of mind where you're doing certain things. But the other aspect, which I've sort of experienced as well from it, is the, is the opportunity to get a different perspective, a completely different view, and open your mind in in a way that you wouldn't have thought possible, and see events, instances, experiences, emotions life in a in a completely different way to what you've been afforded for your whole life and for me that part is what i'm really super interested in super because i've i've had a little sniff of it you know and i and it and it's it's blown my mind in a positive way and not, not a, i'm a different person way but just a, a a way that's improved me in an area of my mind i didn't think was sort of looking for improvement if you know what i mean tell me about the tell me about the uh tell me about your first ayahuasca experience there with the shaman talk me through that what was that like how did that come about you know? uh, well it was daunting because i had no idea you know i i wasn't talking to anyone about psychedelic therapy at that point i didn't know anything about ayahuasca other than that it was a weird hopefully healing experience that was all i pretty much knew i just going on the trust in my friend and this network of local people that were there to help me. But I felt intuitively that it, it was worthy of my trust. I didn't feel threatened in any way, but it was still daunting because I thought, you know what, if this works, then who the hell do I become? If this heals me, who, I mean, the potential is one limitless, but two very scary because we cling on to these narratives that we, that we are like, or I'm a veteran, I'm a reg bloke, or I'm a banker for JP Morgan, or all of these narratives. And you wonder, well, if I have too big an experience, maybe I've become something that I can't cope with. And of course you can cope with it, but it's still daunting. 
Um, and so just to recap, like my, my mindset going in was nearly hopeless, as, I, as hopeless as I could probably get. But I felt intuitively like this was the right thing to do for me at that time. And so I was staying in this little hut. I didn't have any electricity, no running water other than the river next to me. I had the fruit on the trees around me. And the nearest next person was probably 500 meters. He had a cocoa farm 500 meters further up the river. So if I needed sort of help, he was there. Um, otherwise, I was just left to my own devices until the shaman came up on the days and the nights where I would have my ayahuasca experiences. Um, and it, he actually came up. I didn't know what time to expect him, but he came up. He just came up through the jungle up to my little hut. And he had a really dirty old Coca-Cola bottle, like a, not a litre one, just like a 75 litre old. And it looked disgusting. It was brown and looked awful. It looked like he just dropped it in mud. And um, he came and sat next to me. He was like, right, you just, um, he poured out a little dirty shot glass of this drink. It was, it looked disgusting. I was thinking, I've drunk worse things. Being in the reg, you know, I've drunk worse things. So <laughs> might as well give it a go. I'm here. But it was, it was brown and thick and disgusting. And um, so I took that shot and I laid down. He laid down. He took a little bit as well. He laid down. And uh, this is at night. And You're sleeping on the floor? On the floor? Yeah, just on the floor in my little hut. So I had a little kind of mattressy thing. Um, he was laying next to me. He just started singing. And uh, it just, after a while, it just, I was listening to his words and his songs. And then everything changed. Everything changed. And I was out in the middle of the universe among the stars and the planets. And I was watching time move and the planets dance around. It, it's hard to describe, but, but I was having what, I suppose what you would typically describe as like a psychedelic experience with the visuals. Um, but really that's just kind of interesting and it gives you a different perspective mentally when you can appreciate the vastness of space and time and the reality of time. But really that's not where my healing was. That gave me a valuable perspective. Like you were mentioning before, you had a sniff of a different perspective and that's important. But really what happened after that was I heard this voice come through the darkness of space and it said, have you finished playing? And I, I thought, oh, um, I'm actually having a really nice time just floating around in space watching everything. And, <laughs> but I suppose if there's work to do, I am here to do some work. So sure, what do, you, what do we do now? And then next thing I knew I was in a classroom like an old Victorian classroom and I was sat behind a desk and there was a blackboard and there was this old lady as a teacher it was only me in the classroom and I instinctively knew that this woman in front of me was like the spirit of the medicine I know how this sounds but I'm just being honest with you how I experienced it I knew that she was the medicine in a human form. It's like a dream, isn't it? You, in your dream, you know why everything's there, like within you. That's a great way of putting it. Exactly, yeah, yeah. you just know, you just know. Yeah. You just know. Um, and she started talking to me about my behavior and my experiences and whether or not, and she would show me them, but I wasn't, emotionally invested in the rim, in the memories like I would normally be like seeing my friends die in Afghanistan I was emotionally if I revisited it in my mind the emotions would come up and I would become tense none of that it was like a dispassionate objective view of the memory which was very relieving um, but she asked me if my current behavior and my current mindset and the way that I experienced my reality at the time, whether that was healthy or whether it was useful for me. And I said, it, it's not healthy. No, it's really hurtful. It's really harmful and I'm struggling. So then she invited me. She said, well, I can teach you maybe another way of behaving, another way of viewing your reality and your experiences. 
And so I said, yes, I would love that. I was actually crying at that point. I, in, re in this reality, I was actually crying at this point because I realized that I was actually going to get the help that I wanted. I just knew it, you know, like we would just say. And this is, is this all in the first ayahuasca experience? Uh, this is actually, being truthful, this is actually in my second one, which okay. was only two days later. But I, it's more valuable for the, for the story to, to tell you how I got my healing. No, 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 I'm just asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, you go ahead, you go ahead. Um, and so she, once I gave her permission to teach me, she gave me these lessons. So she would say, okay, let's revisit a normal situation where you would behave in what you would recognize as your normal behavior pattern. So a confrontation, let's say, between you and a person on the street. So I would, in my head, I would, I would be there and someone would confront me. And I'd very quickly get angry and I'd try and smash his face in. And then she would say, do you think that that's healthy? Uh, no, that's, that's not healthy. Would you like to change that behavior? Yes, I would like to change that behavior. And then she would show me, but she would be me. So she would be showing how she would react to that situation if she was me. I would be watching her, but it would be me as well. Does this all make sense so far? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then so she was confronted in the very same way and she would diffuse the situation with what I now understand is compassion and forgiveness and patience and kindness. And I was at this point I was blown away by that by the ability to do that. And then she said, "Do you think that that is a healthier way of behaving?" "Yes, I do." "Would you like to be able to behave like that?" "Yes, I would." Okay. Now we're going to replay that again and you're left to your own devices. Now you've seen how I would respond. Now you are responsible for your response again. So therefore I would try and be compassionate, forgiving, kind, patient. And if I passed and I felt that it was a success, she would say, very well done. Are you ready for your next lesson? If I failed and I ended up smashing his face in or something, something negative and harmful, she would say, well, you kind of failed that. So should we do that again? It was a very kind and patient experience. And we went on for hours and hours. And it took me from the very basic of personal human conflict and confrontation, which I struggled with. And it went way up to high sort of spiritual ideals, uh, which I didn't think I was capable of comprehending, but apparently I was in that thanks to this medicine. But I had these lessons for hours and hours and hours of teaching me how to behave in a more healthy way in, in this reality, which is what's important. You know, we've, we've can, I, can I ask a question just to contextualize this? Sure. Cause it, it's, a, it sounds crazy and amazing at the same time. And the way you're describing it is in a very rational way, right? Uh, cause it, you know, I'm assuming now I've not had these experiences, but I've heard other people talk about them. Um, they have not talk about it in a methodical way as you are. You, you, you're articulating it really well, I think. But the, to con contextualize it, for you know, people, there are people listening to this who are probably new to, new to the subject, maybe. These, these lessons and, and experiences you're having that happened over hours and hours, these are over, hour, uh, these are over hours of you laying there under the influence of the ayahuasca. So, it's not a, so you, you're actually laying there for hours as well. It's not like a 10 minute experience that felt like hours. You're laying there for hours. Literally. You are having interactions in your subconscious, which is like a dream. It's a dream state, but you are essentially, like the way I would interpret it is, you are teaching yourself the, the you are teaching your, yourself the, the, the way of living in which you wish to live, but it's through a story and through characters in your mind and through this experience, which is, it uh, completely inward, um, you know, inside you, mm -hmm. completely realistic, but knowing oh. that it's, but knowing that's a mind state and, and, and not in the real world and completely rememberable, which is what is different. Is rememberable even a word? It's different to sort of the dreams that we have. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. If that's a helpful way of seeing it, yes, I would agree with what you've just said there. Um, there, I would, I could also put it in other ways, but that's a valuable way of putting it, yes. Like a dream state. Um, I, I consider it to be as real as anything else. I, 
concurrently existing, I believe, thanks to that medicine, that it's that reality is just as real as this reality. But we might be going a bit too far now. So I like the way that you said it, this dream state, but the one that's memorable and one that directly influences my behavior here as a human being on earth in my daily in my daily life yeah and i think that can be hard to understand like so my, my limited experience and and uh, this was actually the first time in my adult life in fact, first time first time in adult life yeah i did mushrooms and um some mild hallucinations i was awake i had a couple of drinks but i wasn't smashed but what i experienced from that was the next day um oh so while i was while i was under the influence of them i that when i talked about the perception at the start when we talked at the start of the podcast i was i there was a few of us we had a conversation and i was listening to the conversation and my and i was conversation of stories i'd heard before but i was thinking and considering them in different ways and interpreting them in different ways than i had before knowing i knew i was as well and i was experiencing different emotions with them and and seeing a different perspective of the storyteller from their perspective that i had before and i, was, and I remember consciously thinking it while i was in the influence you know and uh, and thinking fucking hell i i i hadn't ever thought of that before i don't think i've been capable of thinking of it that way before and the next day for the next day when I woke up, uh, again, very hard to explain. And you, you're really good at explaining it because you were experienced with these kind of experiences. And granted, ayahuasca isn't mushrooms, and mushrooms isn't ayahuasca, right? But the my, I experienced a calmness in me from the moment I woke up that I hadn't. I don't think I've ever experienced in as long as I can remember. And the calmness was not. It wasn't. Oh, I feel chilled out it wasn't like that conscious a thing it was a i i i, I tend to i up to that point i was 10 i tend i still have it a little bit now because it was a limited sort of impact that had on me in terms of time it took after but i wasn't worried about what i was doing next and rushing about and squeezing as much into my diet as i need to do for that day it wasn't there i didn't i, I was like a chill i went for a walk i got up instead of doing what i would normally do pack everything up get ready to flip and go i just went for a wander for no particular reason either not because i thought right going for a walk is a good thing to do because it's good for my mind i just felt like going for a wander <laughs> i went for a wander and i remember thinking jesus christ this is i hope this lasts it lasted for several days you know and uh just chilled out i wasn't a different person i wasn't a different i wasn't different emotionally outwardly i was exactly the same person but i was just uh, in a ear uh, how to explain it i was more happy in myself you know in a way that you could probably not perceive to anyone else out but inwardly i was just like yeah this is it <laughs> let's carry on like this <laughs> wonderful man wonderful i'm so happy for you i'm really happy for you it's great it's great listen can i just say one thing about your experience there just just mm. in terms of because we might be influencing people's decisions here absolutely so i think to be responsible I would advise against mixing things like mushrooms with alcohol. I agree. Uh, <laughs> um, if anything, alcohol, well, scientifically, alcohol is one of the most dangerous substances that we've got in terms of society. It's a drain on the NHS and it, it's killing us. It's killing us. The, not only the sugar in alcohol, but the, the punishment that our livers, kidneys and our body goes through from alcohol. Um, so there's that side of it, but also to mix these substances, I would strongly advise against that, especially if you get into the very high medicinal doses of things like magic mushrooms or MDMA, for instance, or I mean, ayahuasca. Yeah, it's harder because ayahuasca is out there in the jungle. Um, so yes, I would like to make that point quite clear. This is where a lot of people fall down. And this is where some of the bad things about psychedelics that are being shared a lot of the time, not all of the time, but a lot of the time it's because people are mixing these substances that are medicines and have been medicines for thousands of years. We're mixing them with things like alcohol or, and worse, things like pharmaceuticals that a lot of us are on. 
that's that's not helpful and that can be very dangerous that can be very dangerous so i would just like to say that right now if you're going to do this please seek it out from trustworthy people and try not to mix it with anything we need to be quite as as clean as possible and also i will say that the psychological state of people uh, is important to take account of if you know that you're bordering if there's a spectrum of mental health here we're very healthy here and very in a very difficult place here like psychosis things like this if you know that you're over this end of the spectrum i would be very careful about using these substances we have to be very responsible um, and careful so but if you're in the middle bracket where you're struggling you know you're struggling and you could be struggling hard as well you do need to take yourself off of pharmaceuticals and don't drink with these substances as well. Even things like caffeine heavily influences your experiences. So there's lots of things to be taken into account here. But at the same time, you had a very positive experience by the sounds of it. So I, I mean, I love it. I love it. But at the same time, to, put, to build on your point, there was someone with me who did not. Right. someone with me at the same time who did not and it was a very bad experience for him and uh, and that was oh, like, oh i see right okay yeah, there was someone with me who had a very bad experience at the same time and and that was that was just down to what else was contributing to the that sort of that that uh chemical influence if you like yeah um also I'll be one you know yeah yeah also these experiences i know that i was saying through my experience with ayahuasca um it's still very very difficult I was in tears through my through for many different reasons, but I was having very, very difficult experiences on ayahuasca and I've had mushrooms as well. And they've been hard. So there's this idea of having this bad trip that people talk about. Just because it's difficult doesn't mean that it's not valuable, doesn't mean that it's not healing and rewarding. There's a it can be very unpleasant and not healing if you mix it and you do it irresponsibly and you don't take care to do it properly, yes, you can have a difficult, difficult experience. But you can do everything correctly and safely and it still might be bloody difficult. But that doesn't mean it's not gonna sort you out. It's just, healing is a very, healing's a hard thing. You know, it's probably the hardest thing that we'll ever experience to, to heal ourselves of the shit that we've experienced. It's hard, so don't expect it to be easy. You, you had a lovely experience. But when we start talking about, well, I don't know what dosage you took, but if we start talking about very medicinal doses, chances are it's gonna be hard. You, you're gonna to have to face up to some dark stuff, but you'll come out of it. I'm entirely convinced if it's done properly with the right intention and the right setting and the correct dosage and with the, with the right mindset, I am convinced that it will be valuable, but I'm not going to say that it's going to be easy and it's not going to be lovely and flowers and, you know, <laughs> unicorns and things like that. <laughs> it can be hard. So, so, so continue on, continue on with the, I ask experience. What was, yeah, continue on where you left off. If you don't mind. Um, well, so really, really that's the kind of the general, experience it was these lessons yeah, i was talking about these lessons and then the tests so i would have the lesson and i would understand that it was harmful for me and other people in different settings so that could be in a relationship that could be just in my own mind how how i went through a psychological process thinking process um, i would view it see it as harmful or negative she would then I say she because she, she appeared to me in female form. She would show me a healthier way of doing it. I would agree that it was a healthier way of doing it. And I would try and recreate that same behavior that she gave me as an example. If I did it, I passed and went on to the next one. If I failed, very patiently, very kind, she said, let's do that one again. There was no screaming and shouting um, or, oh, you've done something wrong, no judgment, no condemnation. It was just, oh, maybe there's some more work to be done on that particular aspect of, of your behaviors. Let's give it another go. It was really gentle, very forgiving, compassionate, kind. It was wonderful. Whereas my experience with mushrooms, mushrooms, 
I, I would say he, uh, because it just feels that way. Mushrooms is a lot harder experience. He doesn't fuck around, excuse my language. He kind of just goes straight in. It's like, listen, you've been messing around. This is all on you. This is all your responsibility. Are you, do you want to sort yourself out? Do you want to fix yourself? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, let's do it. And it goes straight very hard, whereas my ayahuasca experience was, um, it was so soft and forgiving. She's like a grandmother. You were talking about your experiences, right? Where it, it, it's like there's a person there you're being taught, right? Do you find that, do you find that from your experience and, and talk with other people who've, who've um, you know, uh, especially with ayahuasca, done these experiences, do you find that everyone's experiences are, are quite different? I've never heard the way you're describing it like that before, and the teacher student mentality. Is, I've never heard that before. The way I've know, heard them, the, the, one, the way I've heard it described is, you know, you were talking about the, the planets and, and I've heard it described like that before uh, in terms of almost like an out of body, a, a different perception of, of, of the world, you, what your place is, what, what things mean in general, but not on a specific level like you're talking about with teacher student relationship. That sounds intense. I don't know if I'd be happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, until you're in it, you won't know. <laughs> so. Um, I agree with you. I think my experience was actually a little bit atypical. Um, and yes, from what I've come to understand now working in this sphere is that, yes, the more common experience is space and time and the interconnectedness of all things. I, I had that experience as well, for sure. I didn't mention it because it's so much more common to have that experience. Um, but at the end of the day, we all, we all bring our own psyche and our own problems and our own behaviors to the experience. And we get a personal experience. This is the point. It's a personal experience. It's not a generic experience. And it's, driven by, and be... it's driven by your mind. This is the point, isn't it? So going back to your point of, you know, the disclaimer that you gave that maybe we should have given at the start of the podcast, it's you need to be, your body physically needs to be in the right place, i.e. what's in it and what's not in it. And, um, and your mind needs to be in not a hideous place. Uh, or not, a, well, uh, yeah. Yeah, you don't want to be, you know, schizophrenia, psychosis, the, the, that would be irresponsible, I think. I, I feel for the people that are struggling because it, I'm not sure where we go with people like that. Maybe plant medicines do still help, but I'm not in a qualified position. I'm nowhere near a qualified position to be able to comment on that. All I know is that it feels very dangerous and irresponsible to start talking about those conditions and psychedelic experiences. But there's you, a whole swathe of society that aren't operating at that end of the spectrum, right? So there's still plenty of healing opportunity for lots of people. Well, we, you, know, you keep mentioning healing. There's a healing opportunity and there's the growth opportunity. Yep. You know, growth from a place where maybe they don't need it. I don't think they need healing. There's that growth opportunity, which is you know, partly why I'm interested in it. But when you came back from Peru, what changed? What, what, how, what were you doing differently, if anything? Um, so my son swore to me that he thought that I was sat naked in the jungle licking frogs and that I'd gone mad because I came oh, home. You, you, oh, so you had kids at the time? Yeah, my son's actually in two power now. <laughs> uh, he's, like, he's like 21 years, this year. Um, um, so yeah, I came back from the jungle. I went to the jungle and I was pretty much, I'd been out of the reg for maybe two years. So, so I still, you know, I still had that about me. I came back from Peru and I was like some sort of monk, some sort of like spiritual guru. This is his, this is my son's perspective, you know, I, and I spoke, and it's true to a degree. I had this awareness of the interconnectedness of all things. And I'd just been taught that my behaviors were now harmful and inappropriate. And I was able to behave in a totally different way. <laughs> So it was a profound change. There's no two ways about it. It was a profound change. Did you see them and as a positive change? Entirely. Yeah, entirely. I'm the man I am today because I'm that same man. I've, I've actually grown and developed more. No, did he? Did your son? See yeah, as a yeah, yeah. It's just weird. It was just weird. You know, he was like, uh, you're supposed to be this war hero from Afghan and now you're talking about peace and love and non-violence and so, so it's weird but but healthy right <laughs> and then he goes and signs up anyway 
<laughs> go on, keep going. Um, so yeah, I think my parents were a little bit, oh, uh, keeps a bit different. And, but no one could, no one could doubt that it was wholly positive. This is the thing, it was just like, wow, he's very different. But it's not bad, it's great. He seems to be more peaceful. And I was, I was genuinely, and I am to this day, genuinely peaceful and content and able. I'm, the best thing that's come out of it is that I'm in a position to help other people now. Whereas before I was just trying to deal with my own shit. I was just, that was my whole life. I was just trying to get through every day and just try and survive. Whereas after that, my whole perspective was, well, how can I help people? Uh, what can I do with this knowledge? What can I do with this skill and experience? Well, I can help people. And it's a lovely place to be, right? We've got that, when we, lose, when we leave the military, we lose that purpose, we lose that sense of self-worth because we don't have this role, this respect that, we've, that we build up from, from our position, this role that we perform. But now, if I'm able to help people, I feel self-respect and self-worth and I love myself and I feel so content and grateful with, for my whole life. It's just a wonderful, totally transformed perspective on life from one that was intense suffering to one that is now dedicated to helping people. And I've got my purpose. So many people would sell or pay such a lot of money just for some purpose again, some meaning in life. And it gave me, it gave me that it's priceless. <laughs> it's just priceless. Mm. Mm. Did you, so did you decide to c continue with um, uh, using psychedelics for your sort of mental growth? No. So what, what she told me at the beginning so she, ayahuasca, the, the medicine, sorry. Um, she said at the beginning of the second um, experience, which is where she was teaching me, she said, I'm going to give you everything that you ever wanted and you'll never need anything else other than what you're going to learn here. So I took that at face value. And so I haven't done ayahuasca again. I've only done ayahuasca twice, those, those two times in 2004. 13, 14. Oh, I, th I thought you said it was over seven or eight days that you did a bunch of them. It was only twice you did it. Yeah, I was there for 10 days, but I only needed two. After the second one, I was just like, you know what? I'm done. I'm, I'm healed. So I don't need any more. I could have done more. Could have done as, you know, we, we speak about the charity work that I do and, and perhaps dosages a little bit later. But after the second one, I was just, you know, I'm, I'm okay, man. Thanks very much. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good to go. But because of that, I didn't feel inclined to do any more psychedelics after that. I have actually done mushrooms since then. Uh, and they've been very helpful, but not quite what ayahuasca was for me. So what was the reason for um, experiencing the mushrooms then? Uh, I went into that respectfully, but I went into it more as a, I still had a couple of physical things in my body uh, that, were causing me issues. You know, I was struggling with my physical body. So my mind was doing well, but physically I was still in a bit of pain. And I just thought, I feel inclined to try mushrooms. And my friend did it at the same time. So we went off into the forest and we just spent a weekend um, with a very high dose of mushrooms each. And I asked for help with my body now. So instead my perspective going into ayahuasca to Peru was that my mind was a mess. And it was, my whole life was a mess, but she dealt with my psyche and my behaviors and my emotional responses to those experiences. I went into mushrooms asking for a little bit of help in my body because I come from the perspective from what I understand is that our, our psychological experiences and the stresses and the traumas that we experience from our daily life and particularly as veterans, these stresses and traumas that yes, they affect the mind. But I come from the perspective that the body and the mind are one thing. And therefore, when the mind becomes tense and is traumatized, that's reflected in the body. The body becomes tense and holds that 
trauma and that tension. So it can be, it can be considered something like habitual tension, which we all have and is harmful to us. Um, or it can be doubt outright trauma, like physical trauma. Um, and while my mind had been healed, I recognized that there was still some stuff in my body that I couldn't get rid of. I couldn't, I didn't have the tools I needed to work on the physical level. Like what? Can you, can you elaborate on what you're experiencing or not physically? Uh, yeah. So I still held the habit that I'd formed to tense my body through the, through the anxiety that I experienced pre ayahuasca that, that had become a habit. So when I would experience the least little bit of stress, even though psychologically and <clears throat> externally in my behaviors, I could choose to respond with patience and kindness and all of these things. I, fully able to do that but I recognized that actually parts of my body were still very tense I, I hadn't actually released a lot of the some of the tension from my body like in my lower abdomen I was actually still quite tense and across my chest as well and so I asked for a little bit of help from the mushrooms to help me deal with the physical tension that was still stored in my body the residual tension that was stored in my body and that's when I started going much, much deeper into my work with the internal arts like Tai Chi, Qigong, meditation and other things like that. So while I do that professionally, it's my personal practice on a daily, daily basis. Um, and that is what gets the habitual tension and the new tension because we experience stress every day. The new tension that comes into my body, I release that by way of these practices and not through psychedelic therapy. I not sure if I see myself ever doing psychedelic therapy again, because my mind is in a very good place, but I'm not saying no, but I don't feel inclined to, whereas I still got work to do on my body. That's why I do these other practices. Yeah. I can see how they work like that. And, and I read I, so I, I, I see the benefits of meditation. I, I'm not at a position at the moment. Well, I just not able to do it regularly. And when I say able, psychologically able i just i'm not um disciplined enough to get into that i'm trying but i'm not but one of the things one of the ways i managed to do the meditation is uh, when the fucking gyms are open i like to get in the sauna a few times a week and i'll go in the sauna for 20 minutes and i'll go in the sauna and I'll sit down and one of the advantages of sauna is you can't go into your phone you can't go into anything else you can't go in the book you're there with you and your mind and i like to go in there for 20 minutes for the physical benefits of the 20 minutes but I use it as an opportunity to meditate. And I, I count the, the, the 1,200 seconds in, a, in 20 minutes. And I, I, I try and count the 1,200 um, in, in the tempo of one, two, three in seconds, right? Um, but one of the things, I, I, the way I can, I understand what you're saying in terms of the, the physical benefits that meditation can have is, from my experience, when you're alone with your thoughts, when you're alone with nothing else and you are, practicing focusing which is all meditation is you're practicing focusing you're practicing doing nothing is what you're doing and being comfortable doing nothing you know in your own headspace is that you become much more self-aware self-aware mentally and self-aware physically mm -hmm. and uh, and one of the ways it's helped me on the physical side is i have experienced from that that the, the not um not being ten not ten sin so much frequently all the time but a constant movement where I have to be doing something. The body has to be moving, tapping my foot, tap my yeah. foot constantly, twiddling yeah, my hands. Energy. That just completely subconscious. Yeah, maybe nervous energy, whatever you want to call it. I'm not comfortable being told I'm nervous because obviously I'm a reg bloke. Right? I'm never nervous. <laughs> but but one of the things that the meditation helps me with, just being in the sauna for 20 minutes, in my own mind, closing my eyes, sitting in a decent posture, is I'm, I'm much more aware of my physical state, what my body's doing on a minute-by-minute -minute basis than I was ever before, which means I can see those issues and address them. And it also helps me to spot Ill, uh, injuries much further ahead than what I would do normally. It would normally take until the pain was chronic, not chronic, the pain was really painful for it to me to go, ah, oh, well, now I, I feel a little niggle or injury coming way beforehand. So I go, okay, tone down the running or tone down the X, Y, the, whatever you're doing, you know, I, I see you said, and, but on the mental side with the, with the meditation is that focus. I had real, I had real issues with focus and concentration for a long time. And one of the things with the meditation is it's helped me come, help me come back on, on, 
come, come back online with it and the short-term memory come back online with it come short-term memory on the whole is a lot better but it's still fucking diabolical sometimes but generally it's getting better and i put i, I do put a lot of that into one well, the meditation side but also a lot of, you know a lot of just becoming more uh, aware of uh the mental state, mental well-being, you know, just in general. Never mind the mental ill health, just mental, just be more aware mentally, you know. Partly, maybe partly that's because of some of the limited experience I've had with the with the mushrooms and other stuff. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I'm absolutely on board. The, the, mind and, the mind and the body, they're, 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 they're one. They are. You know, on a scientific basis, obviously they're separate and the way things go about, you've got conscious and you've got physical relationships, but they're one. And one affects the other and vice versa. Physical body, physical uh, healthy body, healthy mind, healthy mind, healthy body. And you hear that repeatedly. But when you think about it in depth, experience the benefits of it in depth and the relationship between the two, it's like a, it's like a, no, pardon it's me, a revelation. It's a no brainer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it is a revelation in in some ways it is a revelation when you really genuinely experience it not on an intellectual level when you fully experience and understand and comprehend that the mind and the body are one and that you can affect either one with the other game changer days can i just go back to your experiences with meditation you say that you don't give yourself much time it doesn't sound like you're giving yourself much credit for the growth and the development Honestly, you being able to understand that you've got an injury coming in your body or that you've got nervous energy, however you want to vocalize that, that's advanced stuff, man. I teach this stuff for a living and I can tell you, your experiences inside your body with your paying attention to your physical body, it's pretty advanced stuff. So I think you should give yourself some more credit for what you've been doing there. Really, really impressive. Well, I'm awesome, aren't I? No, I'm joking. <laughs> You it doesn't are. feel like it. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't feel like that at all. It just seems like I just seem like uh, I'm just just more aware of it because I pay more attention. Do you know what I mean? That's all it is. That's and, what. And, that's and, all and, it is. Exactly. And, and the only reason it's come about is the only reason this stuff comes about is from hearing other people talk about it. You know, um, and especially with the last few years with the stigma around talking about mental health and stuff is is existing, but it's it's sort of getting better. The stigma's getting less. It's just it's just I'm being lucky to expose to a lot of information and I understand it. But I, again. I'd like to articulate that to other people. I, I, I unlike like you know, experience in ayahuasca, I'm not a not a changed person. Over time, I'm a gradually improving person, and that's where I aim to be. It's it's it, and that that's it, man. That's it. Because that why would you want to be? <laughs> why wouldn't you want to be? You know exactly to be the able to say is, that. What a gift. The problem is people aren't people aren't uh, people aren't fully aware or fully conscious of what their body or their mind is experiencing, right? Whether it's positive or negative, and that's shit especially on the positive side you know because if not experiencing fully the positive the, the, the positive players that they're in then that's crap but again on the equal side if they're you know if they're experiencing a, a bad uh, a, they're having a bad experience there's something that's causing them to be less uh less uh content than they what they should be i'm trying to avoid like happy and positive less content than what they could be but they they can't see that that's only because they're, they're just not they're not used to looking below scratching below the surface of what the conscious is right and it sounds all fluffy no it's it's it's, it's just an art we've forgotten that's all it is it's an art we've forgotten especially for the last 10 15 years is being comfortable in our own minds i'd argue that before the advent of smartphones and technology and internet 15 20 years ago we were much we as general in general people were much more in touch with their mind and their body and much more content simply because they had the opportunity to sit at a bus stop waiting with nothing else to do but sit at a bus stop waiting and thinking about the events that have just happened thinking about experiences thinking about the emotions that they feel thinking about what they're going to do later on not being consumed by what's on their phone for example we just had that we were always there was always time to focus on you and think about what's going on and you didn't think about it like that at the time because it wasn't thought about that you're just sitting there passing the time in your own mind you try getting a kid to do that these days. You try getting most adults to do that these days. After two minutes, after 60 seconds maybe, they're going to be one in their phone. Put it next to them. They're going to be one in their phone. They're going to want to stand up and walk about. They're going to want to ring someone. Just not come through with it. It's an art we've lost. And we need to pull ourselves away. I genuinely believe we need to pull ourselves back to it. You know, and, and what, you, what we're talking about now with the, sort of the psychedelic experiences, this is like just a couple of levels up in sort of, understanding or experience what lays in our minds what is there to expose and what can you benefit from it very well said here end of the lesson <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it's great man and all that's required is patience and discipline you know 
Discipline is something that the military community don't really struggle with, but that's a bit of a generalization, I understand, but it takes a bit it's of forced on it, but it's because it's forced on us. Because it's forced on us. One of the things I really struggle with since I've left is self-discipline. Because mm. it's not, I'm not having, I, I, I have to enact it now. Mm. And it's, that's a different kettle of fish to deal with that's than be, and then having to enact it. Mm. Yeah. I think what comes, an easier way to think about discipline is that you're responsible. You're, there's no one else to blame. There's no one else that's going to do anything for you. You no one else is going to do this for you and get you better, whatever, or no one else is going to develop you. No, nothing. It's all on you. It's all on me to do it for me. And as soon as you give yourself that power and that authority and you prioritize your, your life that way, like what well, I'm entirely responsible for how I feel and how I view my life. Then two minutes out of your day to meditate or walk in the woods and try and reconnect with nature, which is, I think is a massive part of what you were talking about there with the digital connection it comes at a cost of the natural connection. Um, just giving yourself half an hour to go and walk in a forest, giving yourself two minutes every day to sit quietly and do nothing other than just maybe watch yourself breathe. I know you count and there are lots of different methods, but just sitting quietly, not, not moving physically, if you keep yourself physically still for long enough, the mind follows because the mind and the body are one. If you sit still for long enough, the mind will start to still itself as well. And with a still mind, all sorts of other wonderful things start to happen as well. Two minutes to start with, that's not a long time. Everyone has two minutes. You can do two minutes five times a day. So you're meditating for increasingly longer periods of time every day. You're giving yourself experiences in nature these are all healthy things for you to do and you're responsible for it. No one else is going to make, no one else is going to sit quietly for you. No one else can go and walk in the forest for you. No one else can do yoga, running, swimming for you. You got to do it. You're responsible. So take responsibility for yourself and do it. It's, I know it's hard. If it was hard, we wouldn't be sat here talking. If it was easy, we wouldn't be sat here talking about it, but we're responsible. So if we start to see it that way and that how much power that is, that's a beautiful thing. That's so much power. We are entirely responsible for ourselves. That's power like few people can really comprehend just how, how precious that is. But just start small. You don't have to meditate for an hour every day. That would be impossible if you've never done it before. But two minutes is definitely possible. Walking in the woods is definitely possible. All of these things, you know, just for shorter periods of time. Yeah, it's hard to convey without it sounding airy, fairy, and fluffy to people who you know sort of not don't understand, don't really see it as that airy, fairy, fluffy bullshit, or just find it hard to see what the positives are on about it. I the way I see it is this. Okay, it's the mind easily worked on. I my I think the way I can convey it in sort of a practical, a practical explanation of how I use. Uh, physical activity or meditation or changing my mind state in the practical senses. If I have a problem, um, if I have stress and stress, for example, if I have a problem, be that a problem at work, be that a problem, uh, relationship problem, uh, whatever relationship, misses, parents, kids, any friends, you know, any of that stuff. Or if I have, um, if I need to find this, if I want to find the answer to something I want to change, maybe something creativity, maybe I've got, a direction I feel like I want to go with a podcast or, or something like that. Or again, go about a relationship the emotional side of things, the way it's really hard to, uh, to find to, it's really hard. To, it's really hard to find the answer, find the solution that you don't know exists. If you're going to stay in the same place physically, right. Or mentally as you always have been. You're experiencing the same things. The key to finding a way forward in anything, improving in anything, finding a solution in anything, right? In anything part of your life is you need to change the way, you need to change the situation for your brain so it enables it to see the problem, the situation from a different perspective. Now I'm not preaching. This is how I'm explaining it, right? You need to see it from a different perspective. And the easiest, most simplest way to put your brain in a different state just slightly, just change something slightly at the very, at the very minimum, is do something 
a little bit different. Do something that is not your normal 24, you know, what you do day in, day out, your mind, mind state. Like you were saying, two, when I meditate, it is normally for three to five minutes. That when I meditate, not in the sauna, I use headspace sometimes. I'll use, I'll use, I'll do three to five minutes, right? But you can, like you said, you can do it for two. If I got a problem, I need to be creative. I go for a walk or I go for a run. And the best, the best uh, ideas and the most useful ideas I've had, a majority of me running. No music in my ears. And I started doing this a year ago. No, get rid of it. Get rid of it. I don't want any input. I want me running my mind. Because if I, my feet are running, I've got nothing else. My mind is running too. And that physical and mental relationship, it sounds, the physical, the brain and the, the body and the mind are one. It sounds hey, fantastical. But it's actually, it's scientific basis for it. It's just on the, on, the, on the basis that you do physical activity, it releases certain chemicals into the brain that influence the way the brain works. It's like, they, you know, I, I, and that's genuine. When I do, uh, when I do the meditation oriented activities, I include physical activity in that, like running or like uh, uh, anything where I'm, I'm not, taking any other information in apart from what I'm doing at the time, no iPod or anything like that. They're the times I am most creative. They're the times where I, I'm, I find it easiest to find solutions to problems that would otherwise have taken days or weeks, or I would not have got a solution. I would have just been plodding along thinking, fuck, I don't know what to do, really, you know. Yep. Couldn't agree more, mate. Yeah. There are other layers beyond that as well, but that's really incredibly valuable. You've got creative answers yourself. And it comes from that removing yourself from ingesting data and being influenced by external sources, Facebook, whatever it is, music, whatever it is, disconnect yourself briefly for increasingly longer periods of day from that. And you begin to understand that you've probably got most of the answers yourself. You just can't hear them because you've got all this noise coming in through the eyes, through the ears all sorts of different. So try and slow down that input and what you're ingesting and digesting, change what you're ingesting and digesting and just try and listen to, to yourself and you'll probably come up with the answers. Um, well, we've got, got a few minutes left. How are you using your experiences now to help other people? You, you've mentioned the charity as well, but so to get, talk to me, what are you doing? Where, so, where, where, what services are going to kind of hit you up for next week? <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of my charity work, we, uh, in, uh, in March last year, I started Heroic Hearts UK. And Heroic Hearts is a non-profit organization aimed at helping UK military and emergency services veterans gain legal access to psychedelic therapy at re uh, retreat centers around the world. So in Peru and Netherlands, for instance. Um, so again, that's for UK military and emergency services veterans. Sorry, just to jump in. There's been some positive, uh, uh, positive news over the last 48 hours about DMT, isn't there? In the UK. We... Uh, it's, gr it's hard to keep up with all of the news, to be honest, because there's so much progress being made. This is really, I, I don't like, this isn't the right term, boom industry, because it feels like it's the industry, but it will be, but it's also just in booming in awareness. Um, so the, the advances that are being made in terms of research is, is crazy. There's very few things are actually advancing quite as quickly as research into psychedelic therapy. You know, you're probably looking at AI. Um, yeah, psychedelic therapy is really a huge um, focus for research across at least certainly Western civilization in U S Canada is very advanced and the UK is kind of not plodding along, but we're being restricted here in the UK with our scheduling laws. Um, so yes. So going back to the charity heroic hearts, UK, we fully fund veterans to go and have psychedelic experiences or the opportunity for psychedelic experiences at retreat centers that we've vetted and that are professional and safe and we yeah that's our that's our primary goal as a charitable organization is to facilitate these opportunities we don't um we don't administer any illegal substances like we so we don't operate here in the uk because it's illegal but in peru perfectly legal netherlands perfectly legal 
So we offer these experiences to veterans um, and it's paid for via our funding. So uh, the veterans, we like to have ask veterans to contribute in some way, normally in their travel, in their paying for their own travel, because then they've got something in the game. You know, they're committed themselves, but we pay for the retreat experience as a charity. And um, yeah, at the moment, obviously we can't operate because of COVID lockdowns, but it's, it's a very, very exciting time for psychedelics and the potential that they can help us grow and develop just as individuals, but also as a society. I believe this is going to be a society changing, a very profound change in society within the next five years, 10 years. It's going to be profound. I hope so. We need a change. We need a positive change, definitely, with what's going on at the minute. And to be honest, until you just said that, I can't, I haven't been able to see a way out of it. The way the way things are at the moment, uh, especially in the Western world, it's abs- it's just fucking terrible. You know, uh, it's not good at all the way we're going. Uh, but you've just given me some light at the end of the tunnel, actually. You know, yeah, no, you might be right there, mate. You might be right. Um, well, I believe it, and the evidence is is growing day by day. With the charity, we've got our own clinical academic research uh, personnel. So we're doing our own researches in addition to all of the stuff that's going on at Johns Hopkins or uh, Imperial or King's Manchester University as well. This research is being done on a massive scale all across Western civilization, again, particularly America and Canada. And it's so exciting. There's, it's not just PTSD, so it's not just veterans. It's on depression and anxiety, eating disorders. There's so much scope for this as a therapy, uh, it just needs to be done respectfully, carefully in safe environments and, and it needs to be done properly. And yeah. like we spoke about with the influences of other chemical agents, we need to be careful of that. We need to be very careful. Yeah. I, I just want to, I want to highlight on that point. I think try and try to mention it towards the start of the podcast before we finish off is that, you know, we, we talk about, especially the mental Ill, Ill health, we talk about practices and methods for improving the situation in your mind, but we we there's that we talk about them as as heal healing stuff and fixes for problems, which they absolutely are. Okay, and and again, different things are different people. Not everything suits the one person. Everyone has it on individual ways. But but also aside from that, the things we talk about especially we talk about mental health, whether we talk about psychedelics, or we're talking about just well, you know, well-being practices. These are things that can improve you, improve your mind, whether you think, if you think you're in a good place and can't place the place you want to be, but you've never tried any of these things and practices and talked about, not necessarily talking about psychedelics again, control just in general. Okay. Yes. This is stuff. It, uh, and this is my experience in areas of my mind where I didn't think I needed improving. That can improve you. Take it to that. You may think you're in a good place. Take yourself to a better place. Give yourself exactly. the opportunity. And why not? Why not try something new? Because especially uh, when you just talk about the practice and stuff, where there's not that element of risk associated with uh, substances. But why not try it? What have you got to lose? Put you give it, put your mind in a different state and experience it and see how you come out the other end because it ain't going to be worse off. You're going to be better off, generally speaking. Um, and I'm, again, talking about the practices that involve substances. <laughs> Keith, you were the man with you were the man with the uh, with the advice and the guidance on the substance side of things. And, uh, well, I can also help with the the meditation and the daily practices. You know, these course, are yeah. powerful tools. Powerful tools. It's what I do professionally. So, the psychedelic therapy. That's what I do for charitable purposes, trying to help everyone really but veterans but um these daily practices things it's not just tai chi i mentioned tai chi because people kind of know the name and you know it might have a negative connotation where people think i'm not going to just mince around waving my arms slowly and whatnot but there's powerful powerful practices that are that even if you're in a good place you're there's no ceiling (laughs) there's no ceiling so just keep improving yourself keep developing keep getting even better and like you say, access to creativity, it's not all about just healing, access to creativity, all sorts of things that can illuminate your life and make things even better. So even if you are a powerful, powerful individual doing, you think, you know, you're doing great, you can still be better. It's limitless. There are aspects of creativity that sometimes I need to, I need to be able to do and I, I, I'm, I am unable to do them effectively without certain 
things in my body. <laughs> That's a fact. You know what I mean? And uh, I, I, it's one of the biggest. It's one of the biggest eye openers has been for me over the last couple of years. All the negative uh, uh, opinions and perceptions of certain drugs and especially psychedelics I had before. Now I see it as I've well, done properly. These are fucking amazing. It's amazing, whoever you are. It can be amazing for whoever you are. Mate, look at the time. What's your website? KeithJAbram.com, right? That's right. Yes. Okay. And uh, HeroicHeartsUK.com as well for the charity. Thank you. Perfect. Mate, it's been an absolute pleasure. We should do this again. Yeah, I feel the same way. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you, mate. Thank you. Listen, good luck with the new year, and uh, I will see you when uh, COVID's over. Wonderful. Cheers, mate. Have a good day, mate.